successfully cool. years of small time. All right. This year's conference is very well organized, as you kind of could find out last night and all the day today. And that we are here is due to a lady. I want to thank her for the great work she has been doing for many, many years for our conference. Joy. it was her to select the location and I think she did a great job and uh, so we are looking forward for this event that, that's all due to your marvelous organization. There's something those who know that we have been doing this conference for many years know that one person did set up the, our program for many years, that's El Knight, who is also here now. He has so much to do with this no, new job that we had to find someone else. So thank you for the many years. <laughs> it was not easy to find a replacement, but we were successful. And looking at the program we are having, uh, we have a full program and we had to turn down papers and only there are a few papers that only could make it because we had last minute cancellations. People had other applications so they couldn't come. So, and he has done a wonderful job and what I saw today, uh, I couldn't see it because of the current sessions. Uh, I couldn't attend them all, but in those where I work, you did a great job. James Robertson. A great job in setting up this program, except for tonight. Tonight's program has been set up by Evelyn, and I also welcome her. I met Evelyn for the first time in 1985, on my first trip to the United States of America. That was the time when I had learned about small talk, when the blue book came out, which is show it, had come out, and I got a new boss and said, that's the thing you need to do, and to learn and to teach at the University of Dartmouth, and I didn't like it, to be honest. If you get a new boss and he tells you to do something you don't want to do, it's a bad story. But after we had written a virtual machine, that was what I made my life afterwards. And I committed to it and founded my company 25 years, more than 25 years ago on the 7th, 7th of 87 to do small talk. And we still have to make small talk. And we have two of our team here and you will meet them when they are going to speak on Wednesday. And uh, there's one person here who I want to welcome very heartily because I already in the opening said on my birthday, when I got 20, 30, my 31st birthday on the 10th of January 1985, I gave the first introduction to small talk at a company. So I was at university and we had a, an industrial <laughs> partner in Munich. And there was a person who was sitting there in the audience and became immediately a small talker. And that's Stephen Travis Pope. I call him Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, with all of that, I think we will have a great evening tonight. And I will give the word to the organizer of this evening, Evelyn Van Oort.
Thank you, Gaylord. I can't tell you how much fun this is for me. Uh, it's been a year-long process, but it's really been since 1979 for me when I first saw small talk. So let's get on with the ceremony here. Uh, Georg already gave his welcome, which was wonderful, and I would like to welcome you to the first 30-year reunion of small talkers. I hope it's not the last. We are celebrating small talk's past, mostly tonight, but of course we want to talk a little bit about what's happening now and what's in the future. This is from the launch party at Xerox Park on April 24th, 1983. These are photographs that were taken with my camera. Some of them I took. Um, the ones I'm in, I obviously had someone take for me. It shows the uh, balloon that was on the lawn across from Park. And on um, uh, the right, bottom right, is a ticket that you would get. And it would, the menu says cake, uh, champagne, or balloon ride. But it was too windy for the balloon ride. So we just had the cake and champagne and just took pictures of the balloon. The uh, proof copy, uh, the top center, is a proof that, a copy of the back of the blue book, that when I went into Adele's office that day before the, the launch party began, she said, you want this? I don't need it anymore. And I said, oh, yes, please, thank you very much. And uh, the other photos are, the, the bottom left is the cake <coughs> that has the small talk balloon on it. In the top right, you can see Dave Robson and Adele Goldberg signing the books. And I'm sitting on the top left photo uh, with uh, Kim McCall, because we were debugging the dolphin microcode. There was a, a bad <laughs> bug that took us two weeks and two trips between our two offices in Palo Alto and Pasadena, and we finally got it working. Okay. At this time, I would like to propose a toast, and you all have champagne. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. This is very, very special. So, to small talk, past, present, and future. Here, here. Here, here. Here, here. And at this time, I'll let Dave swallow his champagne there as he walks up. Uh, this talk will be about small talk research at Xerox Park by Dave Robson. At the end of this talk, there will be a video. Okay, before she turns her timer on, um, <laughs> I just wanted to thank uh, Ellen for arranging this event. Uh, Assistance, which many of us felt uh, that we wouldn't be uh, here at this nice anniversary event. Um, and I am happy and honored to have been asked to talk, although I am not the ideal uh, anniversary event speaker since I have kind of a flaky memory uh, for last week, much less 30 years ago. Um, I have a lot of good memories, but I don't have a good memory. Uh, so uh, to help my um, recollection, I spent some time in my attic with a box of uh, old documents from uh, the bad old days of, um, of the learning research group and uh, came up with a few that, uh, that did jog my memory. Uh, this first one's a, a little hard to read. It, uh, it was from uh, actually the spring of 1973, so a little over 40 years ago, um, which was uh, uh, a little while before I actually went to work for Park. This was how I first found out about small talk. I was at uh, UC Irvine and uh, doing a uh, senior seminar where you had to do an implementation uh, project. And another guy in the class was Frank Zadibble. Uh, some of you know Frank. Uh, and Frank talked me into uh, selecting small talk as the thing to implement. And only after I agreed to do it did he let me know that there was uh, there were no public documents that told you anything about this small talk that we're supposed to be like. Uh, so this is uh, this is the internal park document that somehow walked out the door and made its way into our hands, and so we thought, you know, that would do it. Uh, it's an Alan Kay document uh, on uh, on small talk, uh, and uh, I read it, and um, it was inspiring. It was uh, beautiful. It was uh, elegant, um, but I had not the faintest clue 
of uh, how we would implement such a thing based on uh, on this document. Um, and that began what would be a, uh, a sort of a theme for the next uh, several years of my life, which was trying to figure out what the hell Alan was talking about. Um, so uh, we actually um, came across another uh, uh, nice document. Uh, it had a um, a promising uh, title, Small Talk and its Semantics. Uh, it says, uh, this file contains a description of small talk written in itself. And so we figured, ah, this is, uh, is going to be it. And in fact, it is, uh, it's, it is another elegant document. And in fact, I studied it for years. And uh, I still <laughs> enjoy uh, studying it. But uh, again, I couldn't, um, uh, it was not clear to me at all how we should or could implement this thing based on um, what we had. So the good news for me was that uh, I had no other choice but to go to Palo Alto and see if I could uh, actually uh, talk to some people who knew how to do this. Um, and uh, that visit in the spring of uh, 1974 changed my life forever, uh, uh, and far for the better. Um, and uh, so uh, I did, I went to Palo Alto. Uh, Alan was uh, incredibly um, gracious and generous with his time. The, you know, young college kid shows up and says, yeah, like your whole system was and uh, and he spent 20 minutes, half an hour talking with me, and it was super interesting. And again, I didn't understand most of what he said. <laughs> but he introduced me to Dan English, uh, and that was the key. So Dan told me about uh, activation records, or what we call the stack frames context. Uh, told me about the program counter and how we interacted with the fetch operation and the return operation, and how they all were woven together. And in fact, you could build this thing that in fact could do pretty much anything a computer can do. And uh, that was the key. So uh, um, went back to Irvine. Frank and I graduated uh, successfully. Thank you, Dan, for my, uh, my degree. Um, and then shortly after I graduated, I got a call from Palo Alto saying, would you like to come work for the summer? And uh, so I said, sure, that looks like a good, uh, good thing. And so I showed up. Uh, and um, apparently this happens to everybody that goes to work for Alan. He handed me a copy of Ivan Sutherland's PhD thesis, a copy of Dave Fisher's PhD thesis on control structures. He told me to look at the video of the mother of all demos that uh, Dr. Engelbart did of the NLS system and suggested that I find out everything I could about Simula. Um, probably told me a few other things that uh, again, my fucking memory doesn't, uh, doesn't remember. But then at the end of it, he and Dan basically said, well now for the summer you should do something you think needs to do it. Um, so that was a, that was a good uh, brief. And um, what I chose was something that Dan mentioned in his talk earlier today about the fact that classes and activation records weren't uh, implemented as first class objects in small talk 72. But I well, why should that be? Those are important things. Important things should be implemented as objects. And so I, uh, I chose to do that. We did a system we originally called fast talk because it was kind of circular in its description of how it was going to work. Um, and eventually got called Smallpox 74. And uh, so that brings me to uh, another memo. This is the, the very end of a nine-page memo that, uh, that Dan wrote about how small talk was implemented. I'm glad I didn't have this when I was in school, or otherwise I wouldn't have had to go to Palo Alto to figure it out. I would have just implemented it, and God knows where I'd be right now. Um, but I ignored the, uh, that last little uh, section there where uh, he talks about um, uh, reference counting and uh, allocation of, uh, of stack frames. And uh, anyone trying to do a small talk had better grok this fact. Well, I didn't. Um, and so I figured, hey, you want a stack frame? You do what you do whenever you want anything. You ask the class, you know, give me a new stack frame. And so uh, this turned out to be the world's record for slow small talks. Uh, um, <laughs> most talk, small talks were described, the performance was described as stately or um, <laughs> majestic. Or, uh, uh, but mine was uh, glacial. Uh, <laughs> and then I later actually broke my own record for, uh, for slow um, uh, small talks when I ran the uh, implementation in the back of a blue book. Uh, and uh, so I was running small talk, in, uh, bytecode interpreter written in small talk, right? actually on the Dorado, a fast machine, but then pointed out an image that was all I was trying to do was add three and four and print it. And it would take several hours to uh, do all that. So I figured that the, the word for the performance of that is, um, uh, is quasi-static. <laughs> so uh, you met uh, my two colleagues that were, uh, that were at Xerox with me. Uh, well, you meet Ted Minnett and, uh, and Dan uh, earlier today. Uh, Alan obviously uh, I was, a, was a 
huge uh, presence in the in the early days of small talk. There were a lot of people who contributed to Dell Goldberg. You've uh, you've heard John Shock, Steve Wire, um, uh, Diana Mary. Uh, too many to to mention. Um, one person that hasn't been mentioned that I did want to mention. Uh, he wasn't a computer scientist. Uh, uh, he was a musician, but he really had a big part in holding us all together and helping us be a successful group in the midst of a kind of a wacko corporate research organization uh, on the West Coast. And his name was Chris Jeffers. Uh, uh, and he had a huge role in turning a bunch of computer scientists into uh, a group of people who could, uh, who could do some, uh, some pretty incredible things. So uh, let me end with one last thing. This one's kind of funny. This is a memo from Adele uh, about, uh, <laughs> hey, we need to communicate. We need to publish this stuff about small talk. We haven't been publishing, uh, um, but let's do it. Uh, and so the idea was uh, we're going to take a week off, and uh, we're not going to do any programming, we're not going to do anything but write. Uh, we'll have lunch brought in, um, and uh, in fact we did that, uh, to the best of my recollection. Um, now you see the date on this is 1978, um, right? So we'd be celebrating the 5th or the 35th uh, anniversary <laughs> if that had uh, come true. Uh, so at the end of the five days, we had a pile of writing. We didn't really have a book yet. Um, we tried to wrestle it into a book. We decided that describing Small Talk 76, we kept apologizing for certain things about it and talking about the way that we thought it should be. So we took a break, re-implemented the system into Small Talk 80, and then eventually wrote the book about that. So five days turned into five years, and then 30 years later, here we are, and I see the hook. So uh, <laughs> with that, uh, part two, uh, thank you all for all your efforts on uh, keeping Small Talk alive, and uh, good luck for the next 30 years. archives from Park. This is a video, and I'm probably not going to play the whole thing, but uh, it will be available to view in, in online. So, vintage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the small talk school <laughs> The small talk 80 programming system provides a graphical, interactive approach to object-oriented programming. It includes a standard set of techniques with which the user can explore and develop Smalltalk A class descriptions. Various kinds of information can be viewed on the display. At the top of the display screen, we see an area or a window that is displaying text. To the left is a window displaying a graphical image. Below that, we see some information that is displayed in a more structured fashion using lists of words called menus. There is another <laughs> window. <laughs> this window is partially obscured. Windows can overlap one another, much like pieces of paper overlap one another on a desk. The mouse, is that a good thing? seen in the lower right-hand portion of the picture, is a pointing device that moves a cursor around the display screen. It has three buttons on it. One button is used to select information. A window is selected by moving the cursor inside of it and pressing the first mouse button. A selected window displays above other windows, much like placing a piece of paper on top of a stack on a desk. Information in the window can be selected using this first mouse button. The selected information can be changed. Here, selected text is displayed as white characters on a black background. The selected text is replaced by typing on the keyboard. <laughs> By pressing a second mouse button, a menu of editing commands appears. Here, the command cut is chosen to remove the selected text. <laughs> Windows have identification labels. To save display space, a window can be collapsed so that only the label appears. By pressing the third mouse button, a menu of window commands appears. Choose the command collapse. Okay, I'm just going to stop the video at this point, uh, and you'll be able to view it in its entirety uh, uh, later on. So, we're going to, uh, at this point, I would like to introduce to you Ted Kaler, and after Ted's speech, we're going to ask you to help yourself to salad. We have a wonderful salad bar, and then there will be uh, a buffet on, uh, style for the entree later, and then the dessert will be served at the table. So, uh, Ted, 
Please show us your wonderful cartoon. Thank you. Uh, so first I want to say just one thing. So Andreas Brau was mentioned earlier, who uh, died tragically in January. And uh, probably all of you know that he was uh, essentially the leader of the sweet community uh, online. And he spent many, many hours educating people and uh, patiently answering emails from people who had first encountered speak and were going through all the things you have to go through to learn about it. And uh, I just wanted to say that uh, we should acknowledge how great he was and we really miss him. You can change any method, and you can see the results in the third frame there. <laughs> so I had an office at Park that was at the intersection of two corridors. And so I couldn't resist when, when someone told me about something like this, or I thought of something like this, writing up a little cartoon, and then uh, putting it up outside my office. And people would stop by, and, and I would hear them chuckle. And, you know, if they didn't chuckle enough, I'd rewrite the cartoon. <laughs> uh, so here's the original House of Cards. This is the first cartoon I, I drew. Mm. Uh, okay, so this one says, um, set course for New York, we have a date with Scientific America. <laughs> and this was the 1977 uh, September article <laughs> that uh, showed was the first public display of windows and menus, uh, it was uh, about small talk. And we were, it was the, we had, had small talk 74 that, that Dave Robson was mentioned. It wasn't quite as slow as he was saying here. We actually got used to work on that. Uh, and then uh, we were working feverishly on small talk 76. And uh, so this is the state of small talk 76 when we had to turn in the graphics for the article. And um, so we, uh, it's in an all night session, Diana Mary, whose voice it was on that video, um, put together a, a uh, screen full of windows, including a, a check, you know, uh, like a bank check in there, and a pie chart, and you've probably seen this illustration, and windows overlapping each other. And that was the main illustration of the Science of American article. It was done over an entire night. It was like, I think they got done at six in the morning or something like that, on a, on a very shaky small talk 76. And um, so it was, it was a great experience. And, uh, here. Okay, this one says, uh, Dave dropped a piece of microcode and we're looking for it. <laughs> so this was, at this time, uh, contact lenses were first appearing. And so you'd see people, you know, uh, freezing in the hall, having dropped their contact lens somewhere. We all had to, so this is microcode. Uh, microcode was very important to small by 76 because um, you could make a selection part of your program run incredibly fast. Uh, as Dan was saying, you could do all kinds of stuff underneath the memory cycle and uh, get a lot done. Um, it turned this kind of measly computer, the Alto, into a very fast computer, uh, being able to rewrite. And the first one had, uh, you know, a ROM for microcode, and then we, we begged and pleaded and got them to put RAM in, and then we could we could load it, you know, ten times a day, different things. Um, uh, uh, let's see here. Um, I can't remember what else I was going to say about microcode, but anyway, it was microcode was a big deal, and that's that's Dave Robson there in the, in the center, having dropped his microcode. <laughs> Okay, so this last slide, uh, this is, uh, so we were uh, trying to argue with the Xerox uh, managers and lawyers about whether we could release small talk, okay? Mm -hmm. And so we had to, uh, the first effort that Dave partly described was making small talk portable. And so uh, then here it is portable and it's trained in two panels. And you can see there's the, uh, you know, the interpreter and the storage manager squeezing all that storage over there. And <laughs> the primitives right here. <laughs> <laughs> The objects. And then we, we were having this discussion with the attorneys about the intangibles of small talk. That is, this, we had to put a value on how much it was worth, not not anything, you know, not the pieces of paper or anything like that, but something called the intangibles. We never heard of this before. So there they are at the end of the train on this. <laughs> okay, uh, so um, thank you very much. wonderful salad. And uh, when you're seated, we'll start uh, with Tom Love and his talk. Commercial small talk agent customer in 1983 when he was at Schlumberger working uh, uh, in small talk and he made a custom for me. And he used to call for customer support. And sometimes he called me what, 9.30 your time, and it's 6.30 my time. And I was there, because I'm a morning person. 
and it was great. But sometimes he called us at my lunch time, so he would call up and ask for the small talk customer support department. And the secretary would say, Evelyn is out for lunch. <laughs> so at this time, I would like to introduce Tom Love, who's going to speak about being the first commercial small talk customer and the more importantly about objective speak. Tom? Actually, uh, I was led to believe that we spent an enormous amount of money for uh, a small talk, uh, a Xerox machine and a small talk uh, uh, development environment, that there was this nationwide corporate support group that was available. <laughs> and so when I heard that, you know, quote, Evelyn is out to lunch, this was after uh, being on the phone for maybe 30 minutes uh, on hold while we were trying to figure out who is actually doing something related to small talk. Um, and, and the other thing, when I got that first copy, um, is that I was in a, a research group of, of a building that was filled with uh, AI developers, all list programmers, that didn't want to see this thing called Smallpox to show up on the scene. Um, and so um, what I received was a, a mag tape with no instructions whatsoever, uh, no, uh, no book, no instruction manual. The best thing I had was the, uh, was the Byte Magazine article, uh, which I read and read and read and tried to duplicate the behavior on the screen of the, the magazine, and sometimes that worked, but not always. Um, and I finally reverted to the process of simply, when in doubt, uh, read the source code. So I, I was this loner uh, in, the, in the hills of Connecticut, uh, sitting with my uh, my uh, overly expensive Xerox workstation, uh, trying to figure out how to make all this work, and it was really quite an entertaining process. Ultimately, uh, I, it did work, of course, and, and then came the other surprise in the process, which is the vice president of research that ran the, the lab there um, um, was you know, liked to bring in dignitaries to give them demos of the kind of work that was going on. And, so he, he brings in a Nobel laureate uh, into my office to see this work that's, that's been going on. And <laughs> the Nobel laureate is, is, uh, uh, is, is very surprised at the amount of uh, functionality and the way in which you can rapidly make changes to the code and see this demonstration well logging application that I built. And at a certain point in time, I revealed to him with the vice president of Slumberjay in the office how many lines of code uh, uh, this took, and the fact that every month I was figuring out ways to reduce the number of lines of code instead of adding to it. And the <laughs> vice president of research uh, turned to me and said, uh, how much are we paying you per line of code? Uh, you know, <laughs> couldn't we see if we can, can't you know, revise your contract? Uh, and, uh, it turned out that I had actually figured out how to replicate um, uh, some uh, this particular well logging application with something like 250 lines of code, which was a you know, tiny, tiny little amount of code because I found all sorts of useful things by reading the source code, not because of that. I had any documentation. Um, and that, that was quite interesting. So uh, that's how uh, things got started. Um, I had actually uh, first uh, become aware of small talk uh, when I visited some human factors for instance at Xerox Spark uh, uh, a number of years earlier. Um, Tom Moran and his, his group. Um, and, and then at, at uh, IGT Research, uh, Brad Cox walked into my office. He was working for me at the time and he said, I have this new copy of Byte Magazine and I think we could actually uh, uh, replicate this functionality by doing a preprocessor for C language uh, if we could, uh, um, uh, if you could give me two weeks to, to take a computer home and work on it. And I did, and, and that led to a whole bunch of interesting things. So I'll talk about that uh, in some more detail tomorrow. But I, I, I made a little preparation for this uh, talk because I knew various of you have been involved in various aspects of object-oriented programming and the technology. And I, I discovered in my uh, archives, which is to say uh, my basement, um, uh, a bunch of t-shirts and sweatshirts that I had accumulated over the years. And I thought, you know, what on earth? I didn't want to throw these things away. And I had the idea that maybe I could use them at some point. 
here we are. This is the first public display of this quilt. <laughs> Can you see it? <laughs> here, on oh, this side. Oh, wow. Mm. Awesome. How about that? That each of you uh, have at least some of this here. Uh, uh, thing here. This, <laughs> it's just literally <laughs> the, the uh, tricks that I had in one or, or two boxes in the uh, in the garage, um, and it's everything from the company I started in, on the on the on the sixth of June in 1983 it's called PPI Productivity Products uh, International. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is from uh, uh, a group that I started at IBM called the Object Technology Practice. Uh, this was a, a wild duck flying through an object with a, with a uh, 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 rocket support uh, in the back there. You can see. Uh, not, not a typical group at IBM. Um, uh, the Next Association, um, various uh, object oriented um, items. Uh, including uh, quite a few from the UFLA conference. The UFLA conference happened once upon a time when I was actually flying from the East Coast to the West Coast to meet a variety of people at, at Tectronix, and IBM, and Apple, and, and at Xerox. And it occurred to me in flight, along with a, a, a fellow, a Chet Wazinski, who many of you know from the oh, UFLA yeah. conferences, it occurred to us that we were going to be talking to everybody that might help create a, a, a conference about object oriented programming on this trip. And so I said to Chet, why don't we just talk to everybody and see if we can get them together for lunch on Friday uh, 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 of that week. And so we did that. We had the lunch. I actually saved and I have in my office a frame, the napkin of all the people that we thought would be necessary to get organized for the uh, Oopla conference. Uh, and uh, it, uh, my contribution was writing on the napkin and having the idea, and other people did all the work, uh, which is it's nice. You should take that as a suggestion. It's kind of nice when things like that work. And it turned out to be the, the most successful first conference of the, uh, yep. uh, of the ACS. Uh, so that's what I have to say. Uh, feel free to mm -hmm. up and uh, take a mm -hmm. look at the quilt. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, Evelyn is going to. Hatched an idea also about how we can prepare for the, uh, for the next event. Okay, I'll talk about that right now. And that is uh, starting tomorrow at the park table in the uh, break room, I'm going to put four by six sheets of paper, white paper, and sharpie pens in multiple colors. You have the opportunity of drawing or writing any message that you want on them, having to do with small talk reunion or small talk, anything you want about small talk. And I will transfer them to fabric and create quilts. I'm a fiber artist, a quilter, a knitter, a crocheter. I do art quilts. And I'm planning to make a triptych quilt with a small talk balloon in the center. But this time, I think the small talk balloon will be going into space. And then on the sides will be these cards transferred to fabric, these, these drawings transferred to fabric and assembled artfully into two other quilts. And I will then send it off to the Computer History Museum for if they're interested in displaying it. Or maybe it'll make a road trip. But that's a long-term project. That's about a one to two year project. So please feel free to sign, draw, whatever you'd like, starting tomorrow. Okay. And we do need to move the quilt so that we can see the screen. Oh, yeah. Short quilt. That's pretty good. Very much. That quilt is fabulous. And I did bring some more t-shirts. I have a whole bag full of t-shirts from various conferences that I'll, uh, I'll put up by the park table tomorrow. Plus, I'll have some other memorabilia. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Next up is Alan Wurfsbrock, who's going to speak about small talk at Tectronics. And of course, everyone knows that Alan is known as the uh, father of Tectronic small talk. Alan? Thank you.
Well, so um, I'm not actually going to use the slides here because I, or most of them, because I had a chance this morning to talk through it, and so I'm not going to repeat the stuff. So I think what I'm going to skip through here is is to this slide and spend a little bit more time about uh, the, the people and the companies that flew uh, that flowed out of Tektronix related to small hockey and stuff. And uh, I guess the first thing. Um, I should probably mention a couple of people uh, who aren't here any longer. Um, one name that shows up here repeatedly, and I think is probably the most traveled small talk virtual machine implementer, was Paul McCola. Mm. And uh, we lost Paul um, a handful of years ago. Uh, Paul was um, one of, you know, my. My cohort at, at Tektronix, we did the first implementation. He moved on to Serial, got them started. He moved to Xerox, did work, I believe, on the Dandelion small talk, um, was at, at Park Place. So, so Paul really had lots of impact in the, those early days. The, uh, the other person who uh, is also no longer with us is uh, Pat Cadell, who was my uh, partner in doing uh, implementing garbage collectors and many other things, first at Tektronix and then at Instantiations. And again, Park was, uh, Pat was just a really a tremendous contributor to making this technology successful. So, um, kind of moving on with that, I just wanted to say, okay, so this is kind of what, where people went from Tektronix. And kind of finishing up my talk from this morning about 1988, um, I had a conversation with a VP at Tektronix, and we were talking about um, the way the industry was going. It didn't seem to be viable much longer to build machines that were dedicated to specific languages and, and such, so like small pack machines. And so we were talking about the possibility of, of simply selling the software without the hardware. And this VP said to me, let me tell you about business, son. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Tektronix is a billion dollar company. And so that means for a new business to be interesting to us, it needs to have the potential to be like a hundred million dollar a year business. And you're proposing a software business so let's be, we'll go easy on you. Let's say, you know, if it was going to be a $50 million a year business, that might be interesting. But look around. There's no company in the world that does $50 million worth of business in software. Why would we possibly want to do a software only business? Shortly thereafter that, I and a number of other people founded instantiations. Uh, various other people over time, Tektronix went to Surreal Logic. We had a whole lot of interaction with pe people back and forth from uh, UIUC, Ralph, Ralph Johnson's people, uh, just lots of flow. So what I, what I wanted to do here is start with saying, would any, everybody here who ever worked at Tektronix and was involved with Smallpox stand up? Is anybody here who used a Tektronix Smallpox machine or was introduced? To stand, you guys can stand up too. Yep, yep, okay. I actually own one. Okay, yes. Okay, so now, so let's go one more. Is anybody here who, uh, who worked with somebody <laughs> from Tektronix or was taught about Smallpox? by a person who's associated with Tektronix and stuff. Basically the second degree association here. If you, if you consider yourself a second degree associate. I think that's what you can spell Tektronix. With an X. <laughs> so there you have it. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Let me explain. Okay, this 
video is, uh, will we explain how you did this? Well, we, uh, so this is actually a video that I did a couple of years ago when I was doing a, a talk at the Dynamic Language Symposium that was held with UPSA, and uh, it was about dynamic language implementations and stuff. And so I pulled out my prototype 2404 to make a video, and that's essentially what this. Well, this is in uh, 2010. Yeah. And it should tell you other things. It does. So yeah. So this is a 4404, just casually running in. You know, an afternoon in October 2010, and me trying to clumsily remember how to work it and stuff. And so, and, and the, the other important thing, which you said, I will talk about the music. Is, so, why don't you talk about the music? I will talk about the music. Um, the music is from Peter Deutsch. It's a original composition. He composes electronic music. And when I was connecting with people on LinkedIn and various other places this past year, I noticed. I remembered that he had, that he was a composer, so I listened to his music online, and I asked him for permission to use his music. Uh, and then I noticed that the Tektronix video had no soundtrack, so I put them together, and here we go. <laughs> This is 
the right way to develop applications for OS2 PM. <laughs> OS2 PM is a tremendously rich environment, which makes it inherently complex. Smalltalk VPM remove, removes that complexity and lets you concentrate on writing great programs. Smalltalk V is the kind of powerful tool that will make OS2 the successor to ms -DOS. <laughs> talk to them about this quote uh, at the time we're going to print the manual for, the, for our next uh, small part BPM product um, when it first came out and it's kind of a long lag especially when you're printing like the kind of manual we have but actually have this manual back here and we wanted to quote for the back of the manual so this was oh at least six to nine months before when the product actually shipped um, in that intervening time, there was a major divorce between uh, IBM and Microsoft. We left the quote on the back of the book in the vain hope that he would be so embarrassed by it, he'd pay us to take it off. <laughs> but actually, one of the quotes I, got, I liked best from people we talked to about endorsing the product was from Carol Shelby, famous for cars. GT Cobra, and the Cobra, Shelby Cobra. And uh, he gave us the following after talking about our stuff and looking at our stuff. Anyone can build a prototype by the book, but you create a legend by the seat of his pants. He gave us that because that's what he really believed. About, that's how you build cars. And he really thought it applied to uh, almost anything else. He was an engineer of art. Um, and that turned into something that ended up in a major ad we did that had a big, nice, beautiful picture of a Shelby Cobra on it. Um, and when we took a shot of the Cobra, uh, Carol Shelby was around and, and, and uh, he looked at the car and he said, geez, where did you find this one? It was an absolute mint condition. And he said, I thought, he said he thought he knew where every one of those that existed, still existed, was. And so where in the heck have we found this one? Well, it turns out it wasn't exactly an original Shelby Cobra. <laughs> it turns out my one of my brother, my one of my brother-in-laws, was in a, had worked with Ford fairly high up, and my friend, also another high executive, was a big car enthusiast, and he always wanted to get his hands on a Shelby Cobra, but could not afford it. So they rummaged around in the archives of Ford and found the original manufacturing drawings for the car. And they set about having parts made for what they couldn't buy and constructed this replica car that was perfect in every detail. So much so that Carol Shelby thought it was an original. To me, that was the epitome of a great virtual machine. <laughs> really start? Well, at base, we can say the first small part that we did uh, was at Olivetti. And it actually had a name. It was called Olivetti Small Talk. It ran on a Z8000 segmented machine. Um, it was built in late 1982. Um, and the reason why it was built is Jim and I were sort of winding down on the projects we've been working on under contract to all of Eddie while we were working at CSC. We had a lot of time on our hands, and we've been sitting around talking about what to do, and we thought, well, this small talk stuff sounds kind of interesting. <laughs> Part of the reason why it sounded interesting, well, just as an aside, it turns out for various reasons I won't go into, the virtual memory mechanism that was used in the linkage editor that I was in charge of was in fact a fairly complete implementation of OOS based upon what little information it was in the Byte Magazine article. And uh, anyway, that happened because of the bet, by the way. <laughs> but um, so with well, this time on our hands, we got very interested in seeing what we could do with small talk and asked all of it if we could work on this in a spare time. They loved the idea, they in fact gave us some all of any people. We actually got the thing running and they were kind of interested in it, uh, but they didn't know if they would actually ever do anything with it. 
Uh, and at this point, Jim and I actually felt like, well, geez, let's start a company and try and commercialize Smallpox because what we really wanted to do was write Smallpox applications. So we needed a platform on something like the IBM PC, which we think hoping it was widely held, and therefore would be a market for the applications we were going to build. Um, well, fortunately, all of Eddie decided that they would give us a license with all of the technology to do absolutely anything we wanted with for free on two conditions. The first one was that we not sell anything on all of any low-load equipment because they were afraid if you turned out something that was absolute garbage, it would give all of any a bad name. Uh, the second condition was is we agreed to be put on retainer for a ridiculous sum of money, so in case they had problems with the software we just built for them, they could call us in and pay us even more money to fix it. And that was an easy contract to sign. <laughs> but the other, I think, kind of real interesting thing that happened to me okay, I is I ended up but I'm ready. in Okay. Capri, Italy, in, in 1984, at a conference on advanced personal computing technology. And if anybody has the proceedings of it, I'd like to have it. I've lost my copy of it, and I can't find it online or whatever. But as part of that, I ended up in a minivan, bouncing around with about six or seven other people, being given a, a, a tour of sites of Capri. It was a marvelous day. And I happened to be in a van with Alan Kay, Bill Gord, Dan Corwell, Butler Lanson, and I can't remember the other three. And I don't quite understand why I was in that band. I felt like I was a main character in a, in a, where, here, in a Where's Ball of movie. But uh, it was a lovely afternoon. There's a whole lot of other stories around that, but there is one thing that came out of that conference that really in, impacted me. I had wrote some reflections after the first day, uh, also after having a little too much profit on a half a liter of wine a few beers. But anyway, maybe that increased my ability to see things clearly. Um, and I wrote the notes, and I actually found them the other day. And there were a couple of interesting comments I made. And maybe I'll try and uh, the three of the three keynote main keynote speakers that day were Peter Wagner, Alan Kay, and Butler Lansky. Um, and I, in my mind, it sort of boils down to Wagner's concern for how we do things and what we do. And Alan Kay seems to suggest that this is not important at all. It's the experience we have we, as we do it that really matters. But Butler Lansky's emphasis it seems to be the point that it happens in any case. So the real question is what should we be trying to do? And he believes that the answer to this question is always a surprising one. Surprising in two ways. Often we find out it was simpler than we thought. And secondly, we're amazed at why we didn't think of it before. I, you know, in many ways, I think it boils down to the same quandary we have now. Peter Wagner was a group of people that says, we must understand how we do things. Alan McKay insists that it's the experience of what we do that matters, and Butler Lampson seems to say, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen a lot of their presentations at the time, but they've given sort of their standard one, one on technology and processes, whatever, which is Peter Wagner's, Alan Kay a lot on uh, the new media and working in the new media, and it's relation to cathedral building and so forth, and Butler Larson about the three rounds and where computers were going. Um, I think in many ways that's in fact where we are today, and we're still struggling with those questions. And I still think today that Alan and Butler, and, 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 and Butler seem to have the best approach. So anyway, I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Bosworth, Ted Taylor, Dave Robson, and earlier today, where is he, Dan Ingalls? 
I am here to represent the second generation, I guess I should say. So anything I may ever have contributed to small talk is standing on the shoulders of these giants. And of course, they've been referencing Alan Kay and Bill Goldberg quite uh, intensely. I'd like to talk about the history of the logos that I've had business cards for. <laughs> So this is all the same business card, just over the space of about three years. Uh, it goes back, um, uh, the first thing before I get into this I should say, I'm going to show some more slides about the part that's history at the beginning of my keynote tomorrow. So this is really just a very quick overview uh, about setting up Park Place within Park and then the spin-off and then how we try to, what we contribute to small talk kind of in the period of 86 to 90. Um, so, everybody's talking about prehistory, we know about 81. For me, um, in 81, I was a list head and thought that small talk was like this. Had some of the ideas of list right, but the syntax was really broken. But once I learned the library, I said, oh, the library is pretty cool. Um, but in 82, there were these three Morning and Ingalls articles that we're still dealing with. And I'm going to talk about <coughs> tomorrow again today. These are still the three topics that small talk has to cope with. Why operating systems may disappear. In other words, why are we still running small talk on top of an operating system? How do we handle type declarations and type inferencing, both for performance but also for testing and correctness and readability? And third, how do we handle multiple inheritance? And by that, I also just mean multiple types of sharing, not just multiple superclasses, interfaces, traits, um, lots of different types of sharing other than just inheritance. So those that's <coughs> previous. Um, in 83, as we all know, the Addison Wesley books were published. Also, that's when they started the Small Talk newsletter. So that's uh, December 1983, first Small Talk newsletter, which had news about ports, had errors about the books, and had a regular column for nominations for the worst code in the system. <laughs> and since people keep mentioning Diana Mary, I have to remember, remind us all that many of the worst code in the system were in the paragraph. <laughs> um, also 1980s, late 1984 was when Dorados became available to the developers at Park, so that was um, enabled them to do much, much, much bigger things. For us on the outside, 84 was when Berkeley Small Talk became available on Sun Machines, the first publicly available if you were willing to lie on some contracts and get some fake signatures. Um, but it included the owners, generation scavenging, garbage collector, and performed at 8% the speed of Dorado, which was blindingly fast. Uh, a little later on, Peter Deutsch and Alan Schiffman wrote the PS, the Portable Small Talk Virtual Machine, which was, importantly, the first just-in-time translator. They called it native code caching and all other terms, but later on... Um, so, moving a little forward, in 1985, we heard from Alan about the tectonic ports. Uh, George mentioned, Garrett Hay mentioned that I was working in Munich and we had a, a German port that ran about half the speed of, of, of uh, the tectonic ports, embarrassingly. Um, what was important for me was in 1985, in the Small Talk newsletter, they published the PS statistics running faster than a Dorado. And that's when I kind of said, oh, I have to go to California, even though I love Munich. Um, also in 1985, the C programming language book was published and people started talking about the nightmare of C++. Um, in 86 was when we kind of started moving out of park. So there was a mature PS virtual machine running on Suns and on Apples. Uh, all of the tools obviously important. The, the virtual machine was written in assembly language for which Ron Carter had written an assembly language browser in Smalltalk, which I couldn't find any pictures of. Um, and PPS, do, do we have that slide? Isn't there a picture? No, okay. Um, I have some, some slides that I'll show tomorrow about, that in quotes, establishing a company within Xerox, that Xerox didn't improve of it. Uh, at the first move slot, I remember there being buttons saying, I deserve better than a C++, and if anybody has one, I would pay good money for the little buttons that I say, I deserve better than a C++. Okay, awesome. And tomorrow I'll talk a little bit about the version 3.0. These are just some pictures for those who don't know Park. Uh, this is, uh, the bottom picture is Nabo Otsuka, who is from Fuji Xerox, and David Leeds and myself in our first office at Park. Um, this is the, the important picture of our first public sort of presence at Upsilon 1986 as a startup company. And we had this blue flyer that we were handing out. 
completely illegally and unbeknownst to Park, or to Xerox. Said Park Place Systems, with the address of 3300 Coyote Hill Road, um, had a picture of the virtual image with all these logos that you're not allowed to use, like the Bar and Bail Reader and the AT&T logo. Huh. But described portable virtual machine didn't say exactly what it ran because we didn't want to say Sun or Apple. Um, in 87, we moved forward, we got a building, weaned ourselves off park. But also importantly here was we started writing the code that is now part of the system, like the unified I.O. system and exception handling. Um, the NBC cookbook was published. Uh, started working in 87 and then 88 on the Navigator product, which gave us the wrapper GUI framework that is, is part of it. There's pictures of Gang Road. Um, early release doc, of course, we used Toothpaste. Adele had a really good drawing hand, so she could draw with Toothpaste and spell a good calligraphy with the Toothpaste demo that Alan showed you a little earlier. Um, the actual spinoff finally took place, and what I remember from that was that uh, Adele spent all her time talking with the lawyers and the bankers. And I have at least four, this, this uh, right hand one, if you can't read it, says fourth amended and restated articles of incorporation of court places. <laughs> so Adele would spend all day talking to the bankers and lawyers and reincorporating another time, <clears throat> and then come in the evening and work with Dave Leaves and me on the Navigator, because that was fun, all the stuff we were doing these books. And there's lots of jealousy about the other people in the company, which I really don't want to get into. Um, in 89, Adele and I published a, a article called Object Oriented is Not Enough, basically picking on C++ by saying, yeah, you can have objects in the language. If you don't have libraries and tools and a methodology, who cares about the syntax of your damn language? Part of the question. Um, and Peter Deutsch also published something in ECU called the Past, Present, and Future of Smalltalk, which I thought was very interesting because a lot of these topics are still topics that we're dealing with today. Um, uh, people already mentioned Objectworks C++. This was our first attempt to uh, port the Smalltalk development environment to C++ on top of the Navigator framework, after Peter Deutsch had promised that that framework was never going to leave the building. So this was a little, little win for us. Uh, unfortunately, we used Cfunk and it was just very unacceptably slow. Um, so, Objectworks becoming visual works was incorporating the wrapper framework from the Navigator into the, the prior small talk, the GUI painter, what they called at that point chameleon view, which is now referred to generally as plug the look and feel. Um, were all things that David Leeds and I had been on the side for this little side project for the spooks and for Ardent, never really intending it for the main small talk. That's why we never normalized the names. We got names like wrappers and decorators and adapters, and other names were its value model, value holder, application model. So those were two different group packages that we never quite merged. Um, kind of finishing up, I had left by this time, but by 1995, you see this whole list of products of web front ends and back ends and databases and business graphics. So it had really at least grown and merged, and you might want to say matured, that's a word I'm not going to put there. Uh, but at least evolved, let's say. Evolved into something that is sort of the basis of most small talks today. Uh, just to finish up, 95 was also when Java was introduced, and Adele Goldberg's comment was, gee, it's just a pity that they didn't steal the whole thing. <laughs> Meaning the dynamicity and some of the nicer features of, of uh, small talk. So thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Taylor Instantiations. Mike. Mike really helped me out uh, on organizing this in between teleconferences because sometimes I didn't know who was who and who was doing what and he helped me. So thank you. Ellen gets all the credit. <laughs> So I was thinking about this, it's like my 30th anniversary of small talk. I hate to say that in a way, but instantiations were a little bit like the Beach Boys. I mean, we've had the same name for a long time. We've done some pretty good music, and we still have some of the original players, but we also have a bunch of new band members. So it's, it's, just, it's just kind of weird that way. 
Alan Wurstock has kind of gone through a lot of the flow and saw that beautiful chart he had about the flow of companies out of Tektronics. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about the music that Instantiations did over the years. And I'm going to reach back and um, let's see. This is uh, 1989, so this is the first incarnation of Instantiations. Um, I'm going to reach back and sort of claim for instantiation so impressive for Technonic Small Talk because a lot of the key contributors came um, out of Technonics. Uh, this is, I really just wanted to show another picture of young Alan. <laughs> and then there's one of young Mike just to prove that there once was one. And, but um, essentially, so Tech Small Talk. Then we um, started instantiations, we merged with Digitalk, where we made um, pretty serious contributions to VSE, Visual Small Talk Enterprise. <laughs> Great product. Um, we then, uh, in, let's see, so in 92, we merged with Digitalk. A few years later, we merged with Park Place. Um, there, I'm a business guy, not technical, so from a business perspective, we were going to slam VSE and Visual Works together and make this great product. Its code name was Jigsaw. It, it, it was a puzzle that was never solved. Um, so, depending on how you want to look at it, we were either ejected from our place Digitalk or we, we spun out again and form instant, reform instantiations that were kind enough to give us the name back. Uh, <laughs> there, we did, we, we started the business with a, a group of small top products from a company called Object Share. So many of you know Eric Kleiber, things like Window Builder Pro, VA Assist. These were the products that we used to get instantiations to started. And there, we, we, we're all, we always did small talk, and we also took a minor departure over into Java. And we actually did some very successful Java products on the Eclipse Open Source Foundation. Um, yeah, the foundation, not the foundation of the software company, but the, the, the software itself. So then, so that went on for years. Ultimately, we sold the Java stuff off to Google sort of started instantiations again for the third time. And um, Google was, they were a great company to deal with. I worked there for six months in a transition role. They were, the deal was pretty much done when we decided to spin out of the small talk stuff. And they were kind enough to make that really easy and give us the name back and the whole thing. Um, I skipped over in 2005, we, because of our really good relationship with IBM, we acquired the rights to VA small talk or visual age small talk. And so we, we developed that, we developed that, we developed that. We took that with us. Um, Google got the Java stuff, Instantiations got the small talk stuff. And uh, we're, we have been, you know, madly developing it, and modernizing it, and taking it forward. And from my perspective, I'm, I hope we're doing it. 30 years from now, and you know, it looks like we may be. So I'm going to close by asking all the current instantiators to stand up. <coughs> Most of us aren't here, but happily they're back at the ranch coding. But and then anybody who's ever worked for instantiations, whether you were an employee, a contractor, or whatever, um, stand up. So see, it's a pretty illustrious group. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Martin McClure. Uh, originally, I invited Monty Williams to speak, but he retired recently, and he regrets that he couldn't come tonight, but he was very happy uh, to that Martin was going to be here instead. So, Martin? 
I feel like a newbie. I've only been using small talk for 28 years, and <laughs> after all the presentations we've just seen, that's not that long. So, uh, anyway, they say that the more things change, the more they stay the same. That's uh, certainly been true of Gemstone Small Talk. Starting in uh, 1981, when uh, Lem Teen Pao decided that he really needed to do something about the fact that he was having trouble getting enough information about running the billion dollar Indonesian business that his father had left him. So in 1982, he founded the Serbio Logic Development Corporation to solve this problem for him. The original idea was to build a hardware database machine. Um, although I don't think it was actually supposed to be powered by lightning. <laughs> and this is a prototype board. This is being held by uh, Bob Brettel, one of the original engineers. He still has that in his desk drawer. Alan Otis has another board in his desk drawer to this day. But soon they realized that hardware was improving fast enough that they could just write software and then just ride the wave of the hardware as it came up. So they based something on Smalltalk, because you know a lot of them came from the Dictronics group, as we've been hearing. And they named the product Gemstone. And so Gemstone went on over time, and things started changing. And this happens to be the, the gold watch that I was given the day I was hired at Gemstone. Paul was an unconventional company. So over time, things started changing. And one of the things that changed a lot was the company name. So they shortened it from Serbio Logic Development Corporation to just Serbio. And then, oh, let's call the company Gemstone. We'll name it after the product. And then in 2000, we were bought by a German company named Brocat, who immediately changed their logo to a dandelion being blown away in the wind, which was unfortunately prophetic. <laughs> the one year they were gone, but the small talk group and product lived on. Gemstone was reformed. And we did unfortunately suffer the tragic loss of the syrups from our logo. <laughs> but things went on. And then in 2010, we were purchased by VMware, which was a much better partnership than the one uh, with Brocat. Uh, and then just a month ago, we emerged as an independent company again, this time under the name GemTalk. So we're preparing to go forward. So there's been a lot of changes over the years, but there's also a lot of things that have remained the same. So from the time it was first introduced to the public in 1986 at the very first Oops Club, and this is uh, Bruce Schuhart at the booth there. Bruce Schuhart uh, went on to be the editor of the Anti-Small Talk Standard, and, uh, and this is uh, Mike Nastos on the left, uh, longtime engineer with Gemstone. Uh, in 1987, shipped the first copy to an actual customer. Uh, this is the founding engineers, uh, Alan Otis and Monty Williams. Uh, delivering the product on nine track tape. <laughs> and all the way up to the present, you know, the product name has stayed, stayed the same. The company name keeps changing, but the product is always Gemstone and it's still Gemstone. And the architecture has remained basically the same. The idea is the same. You know, take the small block image, make it multi user, make it much, much bigger than memory. Um, although it has, you know, gotten a lot faster and scales a lot bigger over over the years. I don't think in 1986 very few people imagined a single object graph consisting of billions of objects and about a terabyte of data being simultaneously accessed over thousands of virtual machines on hundreds of nodes, which is, which is what we're, our customers are doing today. So that has also stayed the same. And the last thing that I have that's, that's stayed remarkably stable is the development team. I cannot begin to introduce you to everyone that has contributed to Gemstone Small Talk over the years, but I will close by introducing you to a few of them. Hi, I'm Bruce Schubert, and I've worked at Gemstone for 28 years. Al Otis, 30 years at Gemstone. Eric Winger, 8 years at Gemstone. Abdeljit Singh, 5 years at Gemstone. James Foster, eight years at Gemstone. He's been on the road 13 years at Gemstone. Mark McClure, 15 years at Gemstone. Norm Green, 17 years at Gemstone. I'm Steve Raleigh, I've been with Gemstone for 15 years. Peter McClain, four years at Gemstone. Hi, I'm Monty Williams, 30 years at Gemstone. <laughs> Paul Rowe, 30 years at Gemstone. I'm Lynn Gallagher, and I've been at Gemstone for 28 years. Daryl Schneider, 20 years at Gemstone. 
Dale Hendricks, 12 years at Jimson. And he's Alex Cogan has been with Jimson for four and a half years. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> It's a privilege uh, to be back with this amazing community. Uh, I have this uh, huge task of uh, speaking on behalf of uh, a group of companies, which I, in my brief time, cannot do justice to, but um, really this is an opportunity to say thanks. Uh, a small company, uh, these all uh, had roots, the first three, the old brothers, uh, in a group of object-oriented zealots at uh, Carleton University. Um, when the Byte magazine came out, I was in a business school uh, trying to build an actor system and decided that you know, small talk would be a cool thing if we only knew what it was. Uh, and the only decent interactive language we had was APL if you're in business school. And so our first small talk was actually built uh, in APL, <laughs> and I think we can compete for Ted's, um, or Ted Dave's uh, record for speed. <laughs> uh, anyway, we went off to decide to build a company that would build embedded systems in small talk, uh, for which my wife was delighted and became a co-owner of the business as I took our house and put it on the block to raise money to go ahead. <laughs> uh, there was no way any VC funding or anything else would touch a company like that. Um, Soon after that, um, another colleague from Carlton, John Pugh and Wolf Wand <laughs> and Paul White, started a company initially focused on training called the Object People. The Object People, uh, over time, branched out into several products but became famous for their, or infamous, depending on it, as, all, as we all did for our products that we inflicted on new core users, uh, with a great product called Toplink. Um, a group at Nortel and another group of Carlton students uh, worked together taking an internal project at Nortel and taking it out. Uh, uh, that project, I believe, was called Telos inside of Nortel, uh, became uh, Object Time, and uh, Brand Selleck and Jim McGee in particular led that company, and they ended up building something called Rooms, uh, which became Roads for Real Time, and they too eventually got acquired into the IBM board. Um, after that, uh, we partnered with IBM uh, to build Visual Age Enterprise, and I think most of you know the story. Um, during this journey, we had the privilege to work with a group of outstanding engineers in many companies, and there are some wonderful IT products which unfortunately don't have nifty logos that I could pull off the web uh, from companies such as Credit Suisse and so on, which are as demanding as any of these sort of engineering products. Um, the first thing we built was a multiprocessor small talk, an embedded VME cards, uh, hacked into a Macintosh uh, on a VME bus uh, from a CERN, and that became the basis of something called Actra. Um, since Alan's here, I decided not to put up the uh, Envy developer logo, but rather to put, put up his book. Um, we had the privilege to work with uh, George Bosworth and Jim and Mike and Barbara on Small Talk B, uh, which was a real privilege and for which we were, you know, really uh, a standing opportunity. And uh, Dan Ingalls, uh, sorry, uh, Alan Kay provided the Macintoshes, and B, uh, of course, stood for Bavarium, which was the project that Alan was working on at the time. Uh, this led directly to uh, building embedded systems, and thanks to uh, the people at, uh, I'm not sure who to credit, I know Alan was certainly involved with this, but uh, Tektronix, of course, had great small talk technologies, you saw. Uh, however, the oscilloscope team wanted to build an embedded system in particular the oscilloscopes, next generation of oscilloscopes. And so we got invited out through being involved with the initial oops of that meeting that Tom talked about. And uh, Alan and Rebecca were kind enough to host us. And uh, we said, well, look, we're, we're keen to do this. And we actually think we could build a new small talk. And at that point, uh, they said, well, if you could do that, we'd be interested, but uh, you know, we've already got our own small talk. Um, the characters, our experience was a lot of background in building embedded systems. 
uh, which had a different kind of footprint uh, to the kind of small talk AV system at the time. And uh, really, I don't know why uh, they passed on it, but uh, of course, uh, we were young and foolish, so we did it for next to nothing. Uh, but we built something which we called New B. Uh, jointly with Digitalk, we did Smalltalk B Mac and the Embedded B, which was really our focus. And uh, of course, I can't stand uh, acronyms, so that became NB. <laughs> and, uh, um, that was probably one of the greatest engineering experiences. I was there when, uh, uh, I remember very much, when the first, uh, at least I think it was one of the first internal CRC card sessions with Rebecca and Ward uh, working on the oscilloscope design. And there's so many things in that story. Another exciting adventure was building one of the world's first pen computers, the Momenta, with some wonderful guys from DTO, who went to DTO, Steve Ud, and so on. A great team of and that dual. Um, this is a, a real lesson for us that they tried to buy us. Uh, we turned them down and they went through 40 million, we know of, in venture in 24 months, which was a red record at the time. Um, I won't go on since I think most of you know that the roots of uh, Visual Age for Java and the clips and so on really come from uh, Visual Age. In fact, the J9BM is implemented in Smalltalk and the uh, Visual Age for Java was all written in Smalltalk and only changed because of the idiocy of IBM. As we said, it took us, it was a sort of, you know, order $10 million to build uh, Visual Age for Java and Smalltalk. It was $40 million to do it uh, in, in uh, Java, at least. Probably $100 million by the time it was came out. Um, you know, there's a, a, a logo many people have talked about, you know, this incredible so the logo that we paid $100,000 of design which showed everyone working together at NB, right, collaborating, four people collaboration with many compliments on this logo. This, this woodland was made for me by Jeff McCaffrey when I left. And uh, now the real truth is we were so frustrated because we had all these lousy drawings for a logo. And of course, being engineers, we would argue over the number of bits and the color and everything else. And finally, John Wimovich basically we got a new disk drive. He was very excited. You know, it was a 20 megabyte disk drive. Wow. They opened the, you know, the packaging. There's the styrofoam in there and flipped it, flipped it inside out. And that's where the OGI logo <laughs> I, I just want to end by saying thank you. Um, there's one error here. There's two errors here. Um, ITT, not GTE, and I'll fix the slide. Uh, because we actually had the first Oopsie course and implemented an entire operating system on ZAs uh, uh, using a dialect of Oopsie before it became Objective-C. Um, worked with all these things. Um, the other bug the other is I left topic share out because I could not remember the name of it, Eric, but I'll fix the slide. I just want to say thank you to all the people who've been with this, who've touched Smalltalk, who've been our customers. It's been a privilege to work with you. It's a great privilege for me to be on this stage, but all of you should be up here. Thank you very much. At this time, uh, I would like to introduce to you Suzanne Fortman, who is going to speak about Syncom Small Talk, past, present, and future. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you. Uh, if Martin is a newbie, I'm a newbie-er. Uh, I've not been around that long, although I've been around Small Talk for about 20 years now. I. Uh, Learned about small talk on an airplane with George Bosworth. That's where I learned about small talk, and that's where I spend my time on airplanes talking about small talk. So uh, we were flying back to Atlanta. He, we, I knew every flight attendant. He asked if I was in the business. Uh, I said, uh, No, I'm just a marketing person. That's what I do. And he said, We need one of you. And uh, he invited me to come and interview at Digitalk. They were in LA at the time. I said, I won't commute. I'll wait until. It. And he said, We're moving to Orange County. I said, when you move to Orange County, I'll, I'll talk to you again. So uh, I did end up driving to LA. I got the job, and here I am today. So thank you very much, George. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else in the room really wants to thank you for that, but thank you. <laughs> uh, it's amazing listening to the stories here today and, and how much we all have in common. Sitcom 
actually was founded by a gentleman by the name of Mr. Thomas Neese. Tom Neese was a sales guy at IBM, selling hardware. He was one of their number one salespeople. And in about 1968, he decided, you know, the hardware is good, but the stuff you put on the hardware, you know, what you're working with, I'm going to start my own software company. So in 1968, Mr. Thomas Neese founded Syncom. And uh, it was in the mid to late 80s, he heard, he heard rumblings about this thing called small talk. He was introduced to it, he thought it was the coolest thing in the world, he wanted to add it to his suite of products. All of the different companies you've heard about tonight have said, no, you know, that he had discussions about it, but they wanted to hang on to it. It was in the late 80s, early 90s, when there was an internal project within Syncom with one of our product groups, and this product called Enfin by a company, Easel. It's a small talk you haven't seen here yet. Uh, so that project went really, really well. And during the project, during the development of that project, Tom Nees worked really hard. He just wanted small talk in his suite of products. And he ended up acquiring the product, changed the name to Object Studio, and it's the beautiful Windows-centric product we have today as Object Studio. Mr. Nees still just loved small talk so much. He kept fighting and working for it. And it was in 1999 he acquired Visual Works. And we now have Object Studio and Visual Works as Syncom Small Talk. And uh, you've seen some presentations. Uh, you saw a little bit from the product manager today on his perspectives of Small Talk. And when I look around this room, I see a lot of customers, partners, founding fathers, mothers, cousins, sisters, brothers, everyone else. And if I if don't recognize you, I consider you a prospect. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think we're, all, we're all good there. So I started with the past. What happened with Syncom, how it started. This is the present. It's Object Studio and Visual Works. If you want to know the future of small talk, I invite you on Wednesday to attend these presentations with some of our Syncomers, with uh, Art Thomas giving you a nice roadmap of what's going on uh, with small talk. Dirk Lazen and Andreas Feldner uh, will be presenting Object Studio, remember, formerly known as Enfin. And, uh, and Les will be talking about internationalization with Syncom Small Talk. She's coming up here, but really quickly, I want everyone in the room to stand up. Everyone. Up, 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 everyone. Now, in baseball, this is going to impress Jeremy, this is called the seventh inning stretch. In sales and marketing, it's called engaging your audience. <laughs> right now, I'm going to ask you all to sit down again. I don't want you working out too much. <laughs> That's called the seated squat. Uh, when I had you all standing up, I should thank you all for your contributions for small talk and, and, and being here. You might, I was originally asked to talk about marketing. And I don't know if you know this, but every single person in this room, you're all marketers. You're all marketing all the time. By being at this conference, you're marketing small talk. There's probably one other person you told, I'm going to a small talk conference. And they might have said, small talk. Or they might have said, small talk, you know, I knew about something years ago. It's at Xerox Park, probably not the same thing. I know I have that conversation quite often at airports. Uh, but by talking about where you're going and what you're doing and how you're doing it and your passion for small talk, you're all marketers. You're all doing it. So thank you very much. I appreciate everything you're doing. I, I, love, I love getting to see all of you. The reason for the seated squat, you have just earned your dessert. So <laughs> now... <laughs>
that were built on top of the small talk 80 platform that I worked on at the park. This is from a picture I had hanging in my office starting in 1983, and it was called the Software Tools Fair in Washington, D.C. And the reason I like this so much is because it has pictures of our booth, which I put together, helped put together, and it has a picture of a person that I don't have a photograph of anywhere else. And her name is Laura Ellerseek. And if you go to the right in the middle, round photo, round shape, and you'll see her pointing at a, a screen, giving a demo. Laura is the one who at XSIS was version manager. Now I started uh, uh, transferring Smalltalk from Park uh, to use at XSIS. I first saw it in 1979 and I created a demo called Pub Editor. It was a publication editor. It was also called Quicksilver. And that was the demo that I gave and gave and gave to anyone who would come through our Alto Lab. I didn't care who they were, I didn't care. I just demoed. And, and every time I demoed, I had done a little bit more work on it. So this was before the term desktop publishing was even coined. This was called Publication Editor. And it, it, we landed contracts with New York Times, with the EEL system. We landed a contract with R.R. Donnelly, uh, a publisher uh, for a prototype system. And of course, we landed the contract to our group to develop the analyst and the other applications. <laughs> so Laura, once uh, I released uh, Smalltalk 80 in 1983 for beta testing, which Tom helped beta test and other customers, and then 1984 was the first um, uh, completely tested version that was then uh, delivered to Fuji Xerox for distribution in Japan, and it went off to Xerox Canada, and then went off to Xerox Australia, and then went to rank Xerox in Europe. So once that was stable and delivered, Laura is the one who managed all of the versions of the virtual image and the virtual machine. We had the virtual machines for the Dalton Dorado, the Star Wars station, um, the virtual image for just about every platform it ran on. We were selling it at one point in time. We had two prices, one for you know commercial and one for educational and, um, that in the US, and then we had our you know, international pricing. But she had to manage every version of everything of all the small talks, virtual image, virtual machine, of all of the different versions of Amos, uh, Ask Humble, everything we did, she managed and backed up and packaged. And anybody who wanted to take a disc, she would create it. And she did that for year after year after year. And she's one of those kind of quiet people that went to the lab that no one ever sees. And this was one of the only times she went on a trip and gave demos in public and allowed me to take a photo. So she's not here and on her email, but I just wanted to recognize her efforts. And that's what, what the purpose of this slide is. I do have a, a video that I had stored in my garage for 21 years two copies of a VHS video that I had made in uh, 1988 of The Analyst, and Kurt Pearsall, who was one of the developer of The Analyst, um, designed this demo and narrated this demo and gave the demo. So here we go. I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'll play more of it tomorrow. It's actually a 17-minute video edited down to five minutes by um, Stephen Travis Pope. Thank you for doing that for me. I'm the way that information is organized in the analyst is by using a tool called an information center. What we're seeing on screen here is a list of the various information centers I have available to me. One of these is an information center called First Quarter. It's an executive information system talking about the performance of a mythical company. Let's open that up and take a look at what's inside. What I'm opening now is the top level folder of this information center. One of the things that you'll find in this executive summary is another way to find information in the analyst. If we go down towards the bottom of this window, we'll see a system of buttons. These buttons are links off to other items in the information center. This window, yet another document, has a whole series of, of things inside of it. For instance, we have a couple of buttons leading off to yet more interesting information that's related to it. We also have a summary of sales. Here, 295 million. 
Down at the bottom, we have a database tool that allows us to immediately query the main database to find out if those figures are still valid. We come up to the top left corner of this, we'll find an icon that looks like an arrow. If we press the button down over that, what we see is a list of all of the items in this information center that are somehow related to what we're looking at. If we want to find out more about one of these, we can pull off to the side, for instance on the keyword sales, and find all the things that have that keyword. So instead of following just one link, we've been able to follow two. Another way to find information in an analyst information center is to graphically display the relationship between various pieces of information. So for instance, we're drawing a structure tree of marketing information. Here we're looking at a mythical automobile, the PX1, and looking at the various uh, features that are related to it. The analyst doesn't force the user to actually make all of the links he may be interested in by hand. Instead, a tool called the Assistant allows you to create rules that will automatically make links based on the links that are already there. This Assistant rule lets us automatically determine those. The first one, for instance, will tell us what markets we have competition in. And you can see it operating down at the bottom of this window. If we go back and look now, we'll see that we have competition in several different markets. Family, farm, singles, and racing markets. If we're interested in looking at one of these, we can in fact go and point at them and get right back into the information center to get any related information that goes along with that spot on the map. So here we found the forward about Los Angeles and also the sales by office database, which allowed us to produce the display in the first place. Let's look at an example of the charts combined with yet another analyst tool, the forms package. This is a form that has a number of things in it. It has a standard chart, but it also has ways to check which area of the country we're interested in seeing statistics for, and also which kind of chart we'd like to see. I've asked for a pie chart of all of the cities in the northwestern region to see what their sales look like. It's now going out to this original database, constructing the data for me, and putting it all together. The last kind of tool that we have available is an expert system tool. It allows us to make intelligent decisions based on sketchy or incomplete data. This one, for instance, is an example of an expert system that, with very simple information, can determine which kind of rock happens to be a given area. Imagine for a mining application, for instance. By filling in this information and then asking to find out what kind of rock we're looking at, the system will grab any information it can from the form, then ask any final questions it needs to the user before giving an answer. The answer itself says that there's suggestive evidence about 0.7 that the rock is a sandstone. All of these tools together give a user a powerful array of abilities. An ability to deal with geographical information, to deal with spreadsheet information, charts to produce forms that automatically do calculations for him, and to deal with databases. Once you've actually organized your information and analyzed it to draw conclusions, the next step is to communicate those conclusions to people around you. And the analyst provides tools for doing this as well. The document system has a number of features which are very similar to other standard text editors, and then contains a number of other features more interesting because of their power. To do that, analyst provides a what you see is what you get display mode. In this case, this has been set up to be a two column document instead of just a single column. As we can see, it lays it out just the way you'd expect. So we can see that the analyst supports all phases of the operation. Organizing data, analyzing data, and finally formatting reports. It has a wide array of tools to handle a wide variety of different kinds of data, whether they be images, databases, charts, spreadsheets, relationship information, or text. <laughs> Eric, I hear that you have Analyst and all and Humble and the other applications running. And you're at, are you going to be demonstrating that? Yeah, tomorrow at the uh, uh, um, Lightning Talks. Lightning Talks tomorrow. Georg has ported everything. Uh, it, I believe that there's still some licensing issues with the Xerox because nobody at Xerox or Park. Park is now a wholly owned subsidiary of Xerox. 
kind of a separate company. Uh, and so nobody knows uh, how to license it to Georg. And we've been working on that on and off for a year, trying to, Dave Robson got involved and, and helped and tried to help with So anyway, but if you want to see it, uh, it's a fabulous system. And I don't know of anything out there that does all of those things like the analyst does. I remember this was developed starting in about, uh, you know, the mid 80s. So. It's pretty amazing. You might add, so add we'll on? talk more about uh, tomorrow about what I did with Smalltalk 80. I just yeah. want to say you might add that that video was made in 88, so that's still the pretty good. The video early. was made in, in 1988, and it was VHS, and I had it stored for 20 years, never played <laughs> it, and my husband ran into an old VCR, and it was creaking and popping, and he thought for sure it was going to jam up the machine. So he took it to a second VCR, and it sounded a little better. Then he put, brought it back to the first one, and, and, and the images popped up on the screen. So I have to thank my husband for, uh, for re resurrecting that, because I'm not, I looked online, and I haven't seen any evidence of it anywhere. So this is something new, old that's new again, I guess. Uh, anyway, um, uh, next up we have Rebecca Wolfsbrock, who is talking about the future and the influence of small talk on object design. Rebecca. So I remember small type and, and the analyst, and they were like really cool applications. And I came, uh, I feel like I'm a latecomer to small talk. It's like, um, I came from the um, low cost graphics terminals writing in a similar language. And then uh, I had the opportunity to join the uh, small talk team. And uh, Right after I joined, Tom Merrill left, so I, I, I was the manager. I was asked to be the manager. And then I wanted to get back and, and do things. So I always felt like, well, I wanted to figure out what those small talkers were really doing. And, um, you know, small talk uh, was, was a cool thing, particularly when you're doing assembly language programming. Small talk is like, wow. Um, but there's been a lot of uh, influence in many branches of design that have been influenced by the small pot um, community. And you know, probably the most uh, famous one is extreme programming, um, which is really comes from the roots of, again, Alan talked about this earlier, is um, basically it was, it was branding the practices you would do to incrementally, iteratively develop um, an application in small talk. Um, and that practicing this sort of steady rhythm of testing, testing to, uh, and, and working together and collaborative ownership of, of, a, of an application as it evolves, um, you know, Kent, Kent and Ward certainly embody that. Um, also this year, you know, we're talking about um, uh, influences in, in design, object design, but just design in general. Um, this year, I, I happen to be involved in the software patterns community, and the Hillside group was formed. Um, Ward, Cunningham, again, and, and Kent were some of the early instigators of that. But this year is the 20th anniversary of the, of the patterns conference. So it's like 10 years after, just think of that time period, um, design patterns was written by uh, several people who were influenced by small talk, uh, Ralph Johnson and, and uh, Richard Helmer, small talkers, and John Glossides, or Anna. Um, but I'm going to here talk about my influence uh, a little too. Uh, responsibility driven design was something that, um, again, I came to small talk not aware of how the really cool guys did it. Um, and I always felt like, wow, what are they really doing? Um, so I wanted to get a paper accepted at UCSA, and uh, first time I did it, <laughs> my paper didn't get accepted, so I had an experience report uh, on color small talk, but that's okay, I got a color small talk paper in later. Uh, but uh, the initial inspirations, you know, looking at how people really talked about design was came from thinking about what you do 
when you implement uh, you know, an abstract class and um, if it isn't defined or overwritten, we'd say these days in, in the world, um, it would, it, there's a self subclass responsibility method that you would call, message you would call, and it would say, well, my subclass should have overridden one of my messages. Right? So uh, this notion of classes having responsibility and letting go of really knowing the details of how something is implemented, but just trusting that an object will take responsibility if you send it a message, and if it's not, well, okay, I just need to incrementally change my program and make it work. Um, that was the first kind of inspiration for responsibility driven design. And uh, Ward uh, and Kent, at the same time, Brian Wilkerson and I published our paper on responsibility driven design and how that thinking was really different, um, came out in the, the same OOPSLA conference. And this is uh, the first CRC cards that were published. I mean, we, we use them internally at Tectonics, uh, but here's the CRC cards for the model view and controller. Um, and uh, at that time, you know, Uppsala 1989, you notice that Word is at Wyatt Software Systems and Financial uh, Systems, and Ken Kemp shortly was no longer at Tectronics. Mm. But I stayed at Tectronics and uh, came out with a book. Uh, Lauren Wiener was the tech writer who uh, helped Brian and I uh, put our words to, um, you know, into making coherent, simple uh, design descriptions um, and talking about the process of how do you go about thinking about responsibility, driven design. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that the, this, this is before there was new right? And this cover was, uh, and there's no attribution in the book, and my brother has, uh, was the designer of this cover. Um, he's now the managing director of the Agile Alliance, and he says, well, you never really thanked me for that. And so <laughs> thank you, Phil. Uh, so there we have objects sending messages. <laughs> to each other, and that's a subsystem down below. Uh, this is before there was any, any um, um, so I, being uh, someone who uh, likes to repeat themselves, and I, I fell in love with design, and uh, 2002 updated uh, my book, uh, creating a new version with my colleague Alan McKean, who joined uh, Digitalk as a trainer. And so uh, I, I thought it was really cool that I uh, got a foreword by Ivar Jakobsen and John Blasidi, so that was, that was really nice. So uh, I write a book about once every decade or century, I guess, but I just kind of wanted to talk about this notion about being driven, because I hadn't been aware. Uh, the book was not titled Responsibility Driven Design, but I had written about it, spent a lot of time working with Digitox customers when I was with Digitox with Instantiations customers, um, and pushing out the meme of, you know, what is it? It's really different thinking about what something should do and know uh, together, not just separating out data from behavior that they align together. And um, actually, everyone who currently uh, has written books about design, and, and so here's, you know, became driven. So that driven meme is, you know, have to be XDD, whatever driven is. I gave a talk a few years ago at Uppsala and says, I don't want to be driven anymore. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, uh, so Ken, Ken Beck uh, talked about test-driven development, which is really just one kind of practice out of XP programming. Um, and Eric Evans, who was a student of Ralph Johnson, so there's this connection between small talk going on here, uh, is uh, an author that has influenced a school that's really focusing on modeling the domain. Um, currently, uh, the next newest book is the one about implementing domain-driven design. Um, and so testing is a practice. Uh, Steve Freeman and, and uh, Nat Price invented mocks uh, so that you can test behavior and they have a book about that. Acceptance test-driven development by example, and then there's Cucumber and RSpec, which are all uh, forms of behavior-driven design specifications for uh, how do I uh, define an acceptance test at a higher level. And so the current, anything that comes out, 
is, uh, and it, these are all recent books, this century and, and, and beyond, is, is talking about being driven, and which is taking a point of view, and uh, design is not just something that happens magically, but you have to have a set of core values. So you have to be driven by something. Um, the, the domain driven guys are driven by the fact that they want to represent uh, not this stuff that we used to talk about like the real world with objects, but that you really understand what the customer is saying, what the stakeholders is saying, and, and get captured your intentions in the code. And so the readability of small talk, you know, had contributed to their thinking about the design. Again, these acceptance uh, test driven guys are talking about readable specifications of expected behavior. And, and you know, that's the current way things are going. So there's now functional test-driven design and all those things happening. So that's, that's all I want to say about uh, being driven. Um, it all started with small time. <laughs>